Hey, good morning, Trinity. What a treat to be with you. If you don't know me, Ronnie Garcia, senior pastor here. Um, it's good to open up God's Word with you this morning. It, uh, and those of you at home, we're really glad uh, that you can um, join us online. Uh, if you, a lot of you have heard my story. I uh, grew up in Houston, and uh, you know, I, my home was Catholic and hardworking and moral and upright. But in my home, uh, Jesus wasn't the center, right? We weren't just swimming in the gospel or anything. We didn't uh, worship the Lord as a family. But when I was in high school, um, I had some friends, some Christian friends who loved me and they enjoyed my friendship. And uh, there was a certain deliberateness to their friendship and to their faith. I mean, th they weren't pushy. They weren't pushy. But there was a kind of um, alignment between their life and their faith. And my friendship with them naturally led me to meet Jesus. And um, through their friendship, I gave my life to Christ in a retreat. And um, I have often reflected on my friendship with my friends. And here's, what's in, here's what interests me. Uh, my encounter with Jesus Christ through their friendship was not because they took some evangelism course. Or they didn't have any tracks or anything like that, right? Um, it, what it was is that there was um, something in, there, intrinsic in the Christian faith that when internalized gives off, there's a natural mission to it. And we get this, right? I mean, just mention the name Jesus Christ with no agenda in a public sphere and it's, you know, people can kind of feel it. It just does something, doesn't it? Well, their lives, the lives of my friends had this natural missional flavor and it's because the gospel is so totalizing that it can't not engage people, right? Um, it's like music can't not engage our emotions. I mean, music is not emotions, but music most certainly is emotional. Well, in the same way, uh, the gospel, it's not a mission, but it is missional by its character and its nature. And I felt that. I felt that in the life of my friends. Now, I, I bring this to our attention because we, for the last couple of months, we've been studying Acts, and you'll be reminded that Acts recounts the way that the risen Jesus Christ moves across Israel and, and Europe and North Africa, and there's something intrinsic to the message of Jesus Christ that just multiplies itself. It duplicates. And so the book of Acts is showing how this duplication and this multiplication was very present in the life of the early church. Now, today we are studying Acts chapter 13, and it is an important, important transitional chapter for the rest of the book of Acts and for the rest of your New Testament. Everything else in the New Testament is going to pick up on stories and things that happen after chapter 13 in the book of Acts. Now, if you are not familiar with the Bible, um, I, this is going to be a mouthful. Because, let me, but what I want to do is I want to summarize and recount how we got to chapter 13. So ready? Thinking caps on. History lesson here. If you'll remember, chapter 1 in the book of Acts, it begins with Jesus ascending to the right hand of God the Father. But right before Jesus goes, in chapter 1, verse 8, it's kind of like a table of contents for the whole book of Acts. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And then the book of Acts from chapter 1 to chapter 7 is minister, witnesses in Jerusalem. He goes, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Acts, chapter 8 to chapter 12, is now... You, you know, witnesses in Judea and Samaria. And you're going to be my witnesses, not just in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, but to the ends of the earth. Chapter 13 to the end of Acts is to the, the ministry of these witnesses going to the ends of the earth. So in Jerusalem, right, the church was growing. There was multiplication and these threats are arising. It's an internal and external battle. And it ends, if you'll remember, chapter 7 ends with this huge persecution Stephen is murdered. The church is scattered all through Judea and Samaria. Picks up in chapter 8. Now, Judea and Samaria, these witnesses, because of this persecution, they lost everything. They lost everything, y'all. But they did not lose Christ. And so we saw mission happening in that region. And that's where, in that section, where we see the apostle Paul is converted. 
That's where we see the apostle Peter, who is converted. I mean, he wasn't really converted, but y'all remember the sermon we talked about that he's totally transformed, right? And then in chapter 11, these witnesses, right, they're scattered all over this region, and they go as far as like Phoenicia and Antioch, all right? So these witnesses, they're spread because of persecution. They are missional. And what they would do is they'd get to wherever they're at, and they would just begin to meet their own people. They started meeting all these other Jews, and they would talk about the Messiah. And some of these witnesses that were scattered because of the per- persecution went as far as Cyprus, which is like this island in the Med, and as far as uh, Cyrene, which is like northern Africa, like where Libya is presently. And those who went that far, they didn't talk to Jews because there weren't as many Jews in, those er- in that area. They just talked to Gentiles, and they shared about Jesus with Gentiles. And so they took those experiences, you guys, and they took them all the way back into Antioch. Antioch. And when they got to Antioch, all these spread, scattered witnesses, they began to see incredible number of conversions among Gentiles. And this becomes such a big deal that the church in Jerusalem starts hearing about it. And the church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas to Antioch. He's supposed to give some leadership to all this action that's happening, happening in Antioch. Now, Barnabas gets there and he's like overwhelmed with work. So he goes to Tarsus and he recruits his friend, Paul, Saul, right? He's like, Paul, I need some help. This is where Paul. So Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch for about a year. And they have incredible ministry. And it's so successful that it is in Antioch where believers are first called Christians. That's where they're. The first time the word ever, was ever made, Christian, little Christ, these ones who look like Jesus. That's where that title, Christian, is first used. Now, what you see then is the sort of central nervous system of Christianity, the sort of hub, moved from Jerusalem to Antioch. So chapters 1 through 12 in Acts is like, it's centered around Peter. He's like the principal protagonist in Jerusalem. And then in 13 on, it's Paul and Antioch. Antioch is the central hub. And so chapter 13 All right, there's a lot of history going on right now, all right? You know, following chapter 13 is the shift. It's this shift. So to date, God's mission has always been spread because of persecution. But now, for the first time, we're going to see God's mission going forth by intentionality. Now they're saying we're going to a place where we know we will be persecuted. And so we're going to see Paul and Barnabas get sent. And look, next week, we're going to hear about an actual adventure between, with the two of them that gets sent. Now, what I want to do this morning is I want to peek into the source or this fuel that gave them this desire for spiritual multiplication in the early church. There was such an alignment between their faith and their life that spiritual multiplication just kind of flowed out of them. Because I... If we can just have real talk, I don't always see that in my life. I don't always see that in my life. Why? Because there's often no alignment between my faith, I'm your preacher, pastor, and my life. So the question I have for all of us is what means of grace does God give to help recover that spiritual alignment that leads to spiritual multiplication? What, is the, what are those means of grace? And what we're going to find this morning, it's worship and fasting. All right, so that's our outline. We're going to look at worship and fasting as it feeds spiritual multiplication. All right, what an introduction. All right, y'all ready? Would y'all stand with me? Let's listen to the first three verses in Acts chapter 13. Hear now the very words of God. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and sent them off. You guys, listen, the grass, it's all going to wither. 
and the flowers that we find so lovely, they're going to fade. But the word of God, it will stand forever. May God bless it for all of us. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been a part of organizations that just like love meetings, right? Like just meetings for everything. Like, hey, we got to refill the vending machine. Let's have a meeting to decide what candies and chips we're going to put in there, right? Let's, uh, let's have a meeting to decide if we should have more meetings. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And then, uh, and then there's also the style of meeting, right? Or is it more organic or is it like highly structured There are literally tons of books on psychology on effective meetings. Entire PhD dissertations have been written on how to have effective meetings. Now, depending on your personality profile, you're going to have a preference. Well, what we see here in chapter 13, it's this leaders meeting, this elders meeting, and it is like a nightmare for certain personality profiles. See, so the text picks up in in Antioch. And Paul and Barnabas have been there for a year. They've organized, they've named a few leaders and elders, and they call a meeting. It's like a strategy session for spiritual multiplication, right? And so they all arrive, and what you expect to happen does not happen at all. There's no agenda. There's no minutes, right? There's no, hey, what's the latest church growth uh, conference going on in Jerusalem? Like, no, like nothing like that. You ask, you come, you say, well, what's the agenda for the leaders meeting about spiritual multiplication? And they say, we're just going to worship Christ. What? Oh, of course. Like, that's wonderful. And then are we going to do like a budget or something? And they're like, nope. We're just going to worship until the Spirit leads us. Look at verse 2. It says, while they, these leaders, were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. While they were worshiping. In other words, that is the context, that is the resource, that is the means of grace which fuels mission, multiplication. In other words, the alignment of their life And the intrinsic spiritual multiplication came by way of worship. Worship. Can I tell you what worship is, in case it's not obvious? It can be music. It can be. But it is so much more than just singing. Worship, church, is organizing your body and your mind and your spirit to exalt Christ. To put Christ on the throne of your heart. It's important to understand. Every human being is a worshiping creature. Everyone. The question is not if you will worship. The question is what or who will you worship? Because you can't help it. It's like breathing. I mean, you can hold your breath for a little bit. But you're going to let that air back out and you're going to get back to breathing. Well, worship is like breathing. You can't stop worshiping, right? You could be the most hardcore atheist. You are a worshiper. Worship is what originates any motivation in you. It's what actually drives your life. See, we are all designed by God to worship him. Because listen, there is this throne on your heart, in your heart, and something is there. Something's there, and you serve it. Either God is exalted, and his immeasurable value is what moves you to action, or something else is there still moving you to action. But here's the deal. Everything that you exalt that is not God will betray you. It will. And so these men that we see here in chapter 13, they want to connect so deeply with God, so deeply with him, so that the fuel of mission would just course through them. But how is it that we actually, how is it that we actually exalt Christ? I mean, what's happening? And I would say that what's in view here when you see that word worship are kind of three ingredients. It's singing and praying God's word with others. So singing and praying God's word 
with others. In other words, we are using God's word to treasure his beauty and grace with others. And that with others part is super important. Why? And why do I know this? Is because Luke, the author, author, he tells us, he enumerates who these key leaders are. Look, look there in verse 1. Barnabas. Barnabas is this up-and-coming leader sent from Jerusalem. His name means son of encouragement. You have Simeon, who was called Niger. His nickname is a derivative from the Latin, which means black. He's a black guy from Africa, all right? Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene is like Libya, North Africa, also likely a black guy. Manaean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch. Let me just tell you what that is. That is like a dude who grew up in the royal court in the family of Herod Antipas, the guy who put John the Baptist's head on a platter. Manan saw that happen, and now he's converted. Like, it's crazy. It's crazy awesome. And then, of course, Saul, that's just the Apostle Paul's Hebrew name. Paul is just the Greek version there. So all of these all-stars, this is like a multicultural, diverse, metropolitan church in Antioch. And the question they had was not like, can black Africans like be leaders in the church? I mean, like what? Like that, that wasn't even on, that wasn't even a filter. Of course they are. In fact, the church is richer because of it. What they were asking is, and how do we bring the gospel to non-Jews? That's what they were asking. And this diverse leadership team worshiped together. And do you know what that means? It means that each man from radically different cultures had different cultural instincts as they worshipped. And because each of them worshipped differently, the other members of that leadership team got to see a part of God's character that they don't immediately see for themselves. It's like they're all looking at this diamond, right? And they're seeing different facets of it, and, but they're getting a, a bigger picture of the gem because of the other people. The worship is deeper and it's richer. And you cannot get this when you worship alone. You can't get this when your worship is culturally monolithic. The name of Jesus on the mouth of your brother or sister who comes from a different background than you is stronger than your own. You get more Jesus because of it. And these leaders wanted alignment in their life and spiritual multiplication. And so what did this diverse group do? They worshiped. Man, y'all listen, Trinity, we are so privileged to have the diversity that we do in this church. I mean, not only do we have um, Americans and, and Puerto Ricans in the same congregation, and that's why we try to introduce a lot of Spanish into the service and so forth. Like, we really like that God has us here where we are in this time and space. But not only that, But even those who come from the United States come from, like, vastly different regions. I mean, think about it. I mean, we got, like, people from the south, and we have people from the northeast, and people from California, people from the great country of Texas. I mean, this church is, like, crazy rich in diversity, and we're all, like, eating at the same table together, and we learn more about the Lord because of these different experiences and impulses. Let the richness of this community produce a worship that brings alignment to our life and faith and bury it, bury it deep in your hearts until spiritual multiplication begins to flow out. How do you grow a church? I mean, how do you duplicate and multiply? Worship. (laughs) Worship. It's irresistible. All right. So far, what we've looked at is this means of grace that brought this alignment, and it was worship. Now let's look at the second one, fasting, fasting. Now, in order to think about this means of grace of fasting, let me, I want to take us back to the Garden of Eden. Now, in this section, I am indebted to this guy named Justin Early. He writes a book called The Common Rule, and I've benefited so much from what this guy is saying. He's incredible. Justin Early, he makes the case that when God made the Garden of Eden uh, for Adam and Eve, he didn't simply say, 
hey, here's a few nibbles. Here's some rations. You got to like put it in your system so that your bodies don't break down and you can keep working. No, no, no. That's not at all what he said. No, we're actually told that God said, made, made every tree and plant like pleasing to the eye and good for food. In other words, Eden is like this feast that is just waiting to be prepared. And God's like, have at it, man. Right? In other words, humans were actually designed and made to feast, to feast. Now, it's worth mentioning, we do not feast in order to become full. We feast because we are full, you see. God's presence, what you see there in the garden, is what makes us full and whole. And we feast because we are that. We, are, we feast to celebrate now, as an aside, Early says, Fe feasting in order to fill the emptiness is not feasting, it's coping. Uh, yeah, uh, it kind of makes sense with me. So, now, what is in the garden? What is the sin that set into motion the corruption of all things? Well, it just made a mess of the world. What was the sin? It's what? It's when Adam and Eve, what, ate. It's when they ate. In other words, when they ate the forbidden fruit... They inverted God's gift. Instead of eating to celebrate God, they ate to become God. And from that point forward, man's relationship with food is quite complicated. I mean, not only is there like scarcity of food because of corrupt power and so forth, but bulimia and anorexia or using food to comfort ourselves. And so food has become a marker of temptation. We eat to try to fill our emptiness. And so in the Bible, fasting from food is like, it's, it's, it's talked about actually quite frequently. You'll remember as Jesus was preparing for ministry, he was in the desert for 40 days and he was fasting right? He was fasting. He cites Deuteronomy 8.3, which Carson read for us, and he says, man does not live by bread alone. Man doesn't live by food alone. <laughs> well, why would he say that? We must not look to God, or excuse me, we must look to God, not our food, to be our fullness, to feel full, you see. Now, I start with this theology of feasting and fasting because it is a really big deal in this passage. So verse 2 says, While the leaders were worshiping the Lord and fasting, it was in that moment that the Spirit spoke to them. There, there was a kind of clarity and a sensitivity to the Spirit. And the Spirit specifically commissioned Barnabas and Paul to move into mission of spiritual multiplication. And, and, and then, in, of course, in verse 3, it repeats it. After hearing the Spirit, they return to fasting. You see that in verse 3? It says, then after fasting and praying, then they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So fasting is critical to mission. That's a weird thing to say, right? Why? Here are kind of two reasons. First, fasting reminds us that we must be emptied first in order to be filled and this indeed is the cruciform life. This is how Jesus did it. He emptied himself so that he could tend to others. And the fasting, it prepares you to listen carefully. Ernest Becker, an anthropologist, he says, fasting is a way to quiet the noise of the world and listen for the rumble of panic underneath everything. Fasting brings you to a place of empathy. When you empathize with the pain of others and feel that grumbling, it's in that moment that you're ready not to critique, but you're ready to minister to them. You see, fasting creates this deep empathy that propels us from this place of love to take Jesus to them, right? And it starts with empathy. You want something for them. You feel their pain. You take Jesus to them. And the second reason why fasting is just so critical to mission is that it's a kind of defiance. It, it, when you're fasting, it's a kind of protest that says, Jesus is better than everything, even food, right? 
food, which is like so basic and elemental to, to who we are in our existence. See, this leadership team, right, is worshiping and exalting Christ. And, Jesus, and in that moment of fasting, they're saying, Jesus is better than food. He's better. Now, that is high praise, right? Because these guys are saying, essentially, if I have to pick between Jesus and food, I'm picking Jesus, and then I'm going to die. You know, I mean, you see it? I mean, this is high praise. For saying, Jesus is better. So these guys show up to this meeting, and they're like, hey, what's, what's on the docket? Spiritual multiplication for the church. Awesome. What's the plan? Stop eating. Feel the hunger in your heart. Let that hunger be for God. Because Jesus, he's better than everything. And when you are hungry, and, and in that moment of hunger, you can say Jesus is better than food. You are really saying Jesus. I mean, you are feeling that Jesus is better. You are trusting that Jesus is better than anything. And when Jesus is superior... Listen, when Jesus is superior, then everything else in your life begins to find its right place. Listen, in our brokenness, we make for ourselves these little false saviors. We go to things, we put them on the throne of our hearts, and we say, complete me. Make me whole. Fill me. And this leads to all kinds of conflict and slavery. Like, listen, when I go to my wife and my kids and my bank account, and I say, make me whole, complete me, I end up interminably angry with them, right? Why? Because they can't do it. They can't, and I'm angry about it. But when Jesus is better than my wife, then I don't need Amanda to be my savior. I'm actually free to just love her for who she is. I can love her and not insist that she fix me and make my life perfect. When Jesus is better than my bank account, then I don't need my money to be my savior. And and then I'm free from being enslaved. I'm free to be generous. I can have money without my money having me, right? Y'all see how that works? In that moment of hunger, when you feel it, your blood sugar level's low, and you say, Jesus is better, the Spirit gives us clarity to the outright and depth of the truth of those words on your lips, and there you find alignment alignment. And Jesus becomes so beautiful and believable and satisfying that you just want the whole world to have that rest and certainty, don't you? Now listen, we as a church need to cultivate cultivate this means of grace in our Christian lives. Like in our modern day, when we talk about fasting, we're usually talking about dieting, or I'm about to do some blood work, right? That's what we talk about. When we mention those words, that's what we're talking about. But when the church fasts, we do it to empty ourselves so that we can feast on the goodness of Jesus and to desire him supremely over every single other thing in our lives. If you, um, if you have never fasted, so our church, Trinity, we uh, try to do this congregationally. We'll try to fast a few selected times during like Lent, like that period leading up to Easter where we'll give you prayers and scripture where we can all read together and kind of fill that space. But you actually don't have to wait till Easter to start fasting. I mean, maybe it's in your small groups or maybe it's just with a friend. Maybe you just skip one meal, just one, and you set it aside for prayer. And maybe you pray something like this, God, let me empty myself as Jesus did so that I can feast on you. Lord, let me empathize with those who do not know you so that you can increase my hunger to share Jesus with those you love. Lord, bring alignment in my life. 
That's it. Maybe you just pray that simple prayer in that moment of hunger. All right, let me quickly conclude. So chapter 13, we're at this pivot point, right? And witnesses are not being spread by persecution. What we see here for the first time is the church is intentionally going to places where they know they'll be persecuted to share Jesus. And this impulse is deeply stamped into the spirituality of the early church. I mean, that's just what they did. They, did, they didn't even know they were doing it. It just happened. And, 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 and that impulse to share was born out of worship and fasting. That's what it was born out of. Now listen, if you have been like daydreaming, I'm afraid you might have misunderstood what I have said today. If what you heard me say is, you need to worship and you need to fast so that you're a good Christian and God likes you. If that is what you heard me say, that is not what I've said. I'm sorry. Please listen. All humans suffer from this deep-rooted dissatisfaction. And we have to be reconnected to our maker. We have to be. And, and so worship and fasting is this means of grace that reconnect us. And, it, and it, it absolutely captivates our affections and our deepest longings. And that captivation, that love sickness of the heart, being blown away by God's grace, that is what moves us into spiritual multiplication. Not to make daddy happy. He loves you. He wants you to rest in that grace. Listen, other motivations, if there's any other motivation, it will wear out. It will wear out. Knowing that you should do something or ought to do something is never enough to actually do that something. Right? Y'all know that. Never. Only a profound, compelling, cosmic love affair will break us out of the self-centeredness, the status quo spirituality that we live. And I want you to think about this, you guys, and this is where I'll end. The church, it started in Jerusalem. And here we are, you and me, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ on a small island in the middle of the Caribbean in 2020. And it didn't just jump from Jerusalem to Puerto Rico. I mean, it was like this fire of burning love, just burning across the whole world, right? Time and space until it got here. And we would just receive that. And how did that happen? Like, how did that happen? It's just a bunch of people. It's just a bunch of people who knew they absolutely did not deserve the favor of a holy God, but, but here they are, and they're so wonderfully confused by grace, right, that they just, they just wanted it for other people, and it, and it happened. It just totally happened. There's an average Joe saying, I was blind and miserable, but, but now I see. Let, let me tell you about this God who, who knows everything I've ever done. He knows like the worst parts of me, and he totally loves me. You've got to know the Savior. That's the grace that's at the center of multiplication. Who People, when they're fasting and, and worshiping, they feel that. It's just bubbling over. Man, that's what I pray for Trinity. <laughs> what if what if Trinity bubbled over like that? Like it's not some course we're taking on evangelism. It's just people swimming in grace. And the world just wants it. And why wouldn't they? I pray that's the legacy we have here. Let me pray for us. Amen. Father, uh, what a story of... Uh, this diverse group of leaders just worshiping and fasting and connecting their quite ordinary lives with your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Uh, I pray that you would bring alignment in our spiritual lives. Oh, we need it so bad. Bring alignment in our lives. Not that people would look at us 
but they would be just captivated and that their affections would be placed on Jesus, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.